We are going to pick up where we left off last week. And uh, I, I got a different sheet uh, together. Basically altered what, uh, what we have. Now, uh, listen, tonight, if, if uh, this is such a frustrating time, like I said, I was talking to Pastor Fred and Mike, and, uh, and he, he, like myself, is, is a bit on the frustrated side. Uh, it, honestly, God gives to a pastor a direction that he wants, uh, I believe, for the church to go, and he wants the pastor to go, and the uh, pastor strives to do it that way, and it's almost it's almost like a process. I, I, I talk to many folks, say, I go, go church Sunday morning, that's good enough for me. I go church Sunday morning and Sunday night, that's good enough. And uh, I go church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But that's kind of like watching uh, just part of a program. I, I was talking to the kids the other uh, a while back, and uh, and we were watching a television program. Uh, uh, kid, uh, Night Rider. Y'all remember the Night Rider? Mm -hmm. We we came, I came across that on. They now do things all different on the uh, our TV was was the option to watch the Night Rider, and uh, so the kids started watching it. Boy, they were enthralled with that car that had the lights in the front. And the, the noise that would be made, and, uh, and uh, Michael Knight, of course, driving the car, and, and all that transpired with that, it was a neat, uh, a neat perspective, if you will, and it was a neat uh, uh, layout, and, uh, and as, uh, uh, as they were watching it, they watched two or three programs, and they're like, wow, this is a cool show, Dad, uh, I'm like, yeah, the, the graphics are a little bit wanting compared to what we get nowadays, but but the, the, the storyline back in those days, many of those shows had actually a storyline. The actors almost could act in some of those, uh, but uh, just a little different than what we have today. Uh, but I remember walking in one day, the kids were sitting there watching it and said, hey, now, because the whole series, and they can watch episode after episode after episode. And I remember standing and going into the room and seeing one of the episodes on there, The Night Rider, and I looked at it, and Sam said, what go, What happens next? And I said, I don't know. I've never seen this one. And to the kids, they thought I was telling them a fib. They said, well, Dad, I thought you said you'd seen this. They don't understand how life was back in the day. We could watch these episodes on a, a given night uh, for their one hour in the week. We didn't sit and binge watch back then. Binge watching was not one episode over and over again. I mean, one program over and over again, the whole series. Couldn't do that back in our day. We could only watch what was available to be watched. And it was on its particular night. And, uh, and we would watch it that night. And then and the next week, if you happened to be busy that night, uh, you didn't get to watch it. Uh, it just didn't happen. You didn't get to see it. And it was very, it, it's very frustrating because if you ever watched, have you ever seen those two-parters and uh, the program would be on uh, one night, say Tuesday night, you watch it that Tuesday night, and then say to be continued on the end of it. And you're on the edge of your seat to be continued. So next Tuesday, you plan your whole world around being at the TV that next Tuesday. Lo and behold, something happens and you're not there. You never ever get to know what happened to the end of that show. It's so frustrating. Honestly, when the, in, the, in the mindset of a pastor, I believe, uh, God works and builds us uh, as pastors, I think, and as we strive to work and build our people. Uh, not, uh, not as our job, but it's like God gives us a direction. So Sunday morning links to Sunday night in the mind of a pastor which links to Wednesday night, and this happens every week. So when we look out, we see everyone here Sunday morning, we preach our little sermon, and then Sunday night in our minds, as we're putting together our concept of going forward uh, for the Lord, oftentimes we wish those people here Sunday morning would be here Sunday night. Oftentimes Laura will say to me, she said, why do you, do, why do you take such great pains going back and reviewing uh, a message that you just did? Uh, on, on a, a given day because in many cases I look out and I know many of the people here tonight weren't here when I was building this message uh, and leading up to this message a few weeks ago and so now we're trying to get up to it and culminate to a point and I 
just don't know if anyone is going to follow my way of thinking. And uh, I'm pretty, pretty figured out by now. Most people don't follow my way of thinking, but that's okay. Tonight, I want to pick up where we left off last week. I purposely did not bring, I usually have all my notes from last week and have it building so I can lay it all out, but then I'll repeat too much. So I'm not going to. Tonight, one verse is all we have tonight, but we're going to build a whole message on one verse. And really, what tonight is, is just a rehashing of uh, of the last half of last Wednesday night. I went real quick through the concept last week uh, to kind of introduce it to you. Tonight I want to try to lay it out. I want to make it more understandable. Uh, I started off last week talking about troubleshooting. I titled this one tonight. It's just like I said, a little portion of last week's. Um, troubleshooting the Christian life. We need to get to a point in our world, in our mindset, where we understand enough about the Christian life, how to figure out when we're right or when we're wrong. I currently have a vehicle that's acting up. Uh, our little Subaru is, uh, went in the, the other day to Harbor Freight, one of the nicest stores in town. I went into Harbor Freight and, uh, and uh, picked up a, a couple items I needed. I went back to the car. Prior to getting there, the car ran fine. I got in the car, turned it on, and it did not run fine. It started, it was like somebody was killing it. And, uh, and I have tried to get it figured out since. I've changed the spark plugs and wires. Still is not running right. Uh, and and uh, uh, now I'm, uh, they're talking about the coil. I cleaned the ETR valve, which they say on sometimes these little cars, it's a problem. It doesn't appear to be that be the problem. Uh, Brother George is, is tremendous at troubleshooting, and he's plugged in his little device, and he's, uh, he's honed it in, uh, and, and I have a weak uh, cylinder, but it's not so weak that it would run too badly, so it should work. He's, he's thinking, and we're kind of leaning to the side that maybe there's an internal engine problem, which means that car is probably going to go bye-bye, and we'll have to find another car. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't matter. The ultimate thing is, is if, if, if a man like George Herdell weren't around that could come and he knows what the car is supposed to do. He knows how it's supposed to operate. So even yesterday when he was over at the house and he plugged his thing in, we'd change this or pull with this, he'd, it'd run a little smoother for a second. He'd go to the back of the engine and, or back of the car and he'd look at it and just based on the exhaust and how it was running, he said it ain't right. Um, so he knows how it's supposed to run. He knows how it's supposed to be right. When you know how it's right, how it's supposed to be when it's right, then when it's wrong, you really notice it. But we've got to pinpoint what's wrong in the car, hone it down to what's really wrong. If we're going to fix the problem, that's the only way we can truly fix it. And much is the case when it comes to... <laughs> Um, the, uh, the, 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 the same thing is true, I think, of the Christian life. Have you ever had a day when you get up and you feel great? Get up in the morning, life is good, sun's bleeding into the, in, into the bedroom when you get up, and, uh, you get up and you, uh, you're, you're just happy, everything seems to be in its, pl its place, you're in a good mood all day, uh, you, you're, you're, everything is good, and you're going through the whole day. And lo and behold, by the time the end of that day comes and shows up, lo and behold, you've gotten to a point at the end of the day, and you look back on the day and say, man, that was a great day. I mean, everything that could go right went right for once. It was perfect. Uh, got up in the morning, and, and, and the sun was coming in. Breakfast was outstanding. The kids got up and did exactly what they were supposed to do the whole day. I didn't have to raise my voice once, Adam. Man, what a good day. Uh, the, 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 I went out and checked the mail. No bills were in there. In fact, there was a check in the mail. It was a great day. All these things made it a great day. Now, uh, the next day you might get up and, as, if you will, get up on the wrong side of the bed. I can never get up on the wrong side of the bed because there's only one side of the bed I can get up on. Uh, so one that same side, some days is the right side, some days is the wrong side of the bed. And uh, some days you get up and yet you, you, everything hurts, you can't move right, uh, 
everything's falling apart. The kids can't do nothing right. You walk through the house and stomp your toe. Uh, it's just a bad day. And by the time the day's over, you get, you get to bed, you start to, to lay down, and you think back on the day yesterday, and you're like, man, two days ago was the best day of my life. And here today, look at the whole world has come down on me. What a mess. The reality is that we wish we could just uh, figure out what happened on two days ago and just repeat it every day, and that, that way would be a good day. I believe that to some degree we can do that in our Christian life if we figure out some little things, that little triggers, if you will, uh, to help us in our Christian life, to live a Christian life, to serve the Lord. I believe what I'm going to talk about will help us in that troubleshooting phase and also give us a basic fundamental layout for how to live the Christian life and how we can format, if you will, uh, the Christian life. We looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. The Bible says, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I think this is one of the best verses. I heard this at college, one of the college president of the college at the time. Uh, he said this is, he had us learn it in his class, he said this is, in his mind, one of the best verses in the Bible. I'm telling you, this is one of the most difficult verses to memorize. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Very difficult, kind of a wordy verse, if you will, the Apostle Paul at work. Now, we went through last week and defined all those words. And I gave you, if you will, a uh, uh, meaning or a um, synopsis. If you combine all the words and their meanings together, you get this explanation of the verse. Demolishing decisions. You see that underneath there? It says demolishing decisions. And all things elevated or lifted up with pride, down from the understanding of the only and true God, and leading away captive all thoughts or purposes to the compliance, uh, that kind of word compliance means conforming or adopting one's actions to another wishes, to the compliance of the anointed one. Now that's even more wordy than what Paul said. And so I dumped it down even further. Here's dustyology, if you will. Uh, trying to get, get more concrete, I guess, more clarity uh, to this verse. Uh, throwing away my ideas that may be contrary to God and captivating any thought by obeying Christ. That's, I think, what Paul's trying to say here. He's trying to say that the ideas that Dusty Ray may have, whatever they may be, throw that away. Because ultimately, Dusty Ray's ideas are probably messed up because Dusty Ray is a human. The Bible says that God be true to every man a liar. It means that uh, every man includes this man. I'm a man. And when I try to figure out stuff my way, you know what happens? It gets gummed up and it gets messed up. But throwing away idea, my ideas that may be contrary to God and captivating any thought by simply obeying Christ. So, this concept is really a great concept to live by. Just for the record, it's extremely difficult for us to do. Because it goes contrary to the way that we're made. The way that we're made is, I think I'm a pretty good dude. I think I'm pretty smart. I think I can figure stuff out. And so, I, therefore, like my stuff. And so... Uh, if we're not careful, we'll get into this rut where we're just trying to do what we want to do. I've got this figured out. I've got life figured out. Have you ever tried to figure out life and realize how much life you don't have figured out? Tonight I'm going to try to go through and explain to us, and then try. And we talked about this last week, so I'm just going to blaze through this first part. And then we're going to use some illustrations. Hopefully that will, uh, will clarify what I'm trying to say uh, and, and hopefully give you an insight to what's going on here. Uh, real quick again, bullet points we went through last week. Man is a threefold creature. Uh, he will, uh, we will call the parts of man the body or our flesh, the mind or our central uh, control system, why we do what we do, and 
then the spirit. Uh, and, and the spirit is a portion of us is dead before we accept Christ. The spirit ultimately will be God's Holy Spirit. If that spirit, if we so desire to accept Christ as our Savior, then our spirit will come alive. So the body or each person is a threefold being. And I wrote, and we went over this last week, that six arrangements of these three and how they can affect a person. Before uh, and, 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 and so that's how we're going to try to figure this. And I put a little, a little uh, what do you call it, asterisk, and it says this will help us categorize ourselves so we can see the areas that we need to prove on or improve in. Now, in order to try to pull this off tonight, uh, two things. Number one, it's Wednesday night. Last thing we want to do is figure anything out, correct? Most of us want to be in our recliner. Go down in front of the television, correct? Uh, the rest of us uh, want to be uh, eating dinner and in the van already. I understand that. So I'm going to need you to kind of engage your brain a little bit and plug in. Best thing for me to do in order to do that is to engage your brain or get some, maybe use some illustrations to try to keep you engaged in what we're talking about. So I need three helpers. So I've already picked the three helpers I'm going to use. Uh, I would like Chaz, if you would come help me, Joseph, if you'll come help me, and Casey, if you will come help me. These are my three victims for this evening. Uh, they will be up here to, uh, to, uh, to the conclusion of, uh, of everything, and uh, this should get exciting. I'm going to try to put together in visual in, in front of us how and what and how we operate or can operate and we choose to operate. Uh, so uh, we talked about, we defined the parts of man as body, our mind, and or our, and our spirit. And so um, of the young people up here, uh, the most brainiac of the bunch, in my opinion, uh, and of course this is my opinion and subject to argument, but I'm not arguing with nobody, so since it's my illustration, it will be done my way, but I think Casey, so, and, and bodies with the, the glasses and the, the extra fluff on the head. I, I, he looks the part of a highly intelligent, look at that vest, doesn't that just bleed intelligence right there? And so, he's going to be, if you will, our mind, okay? He's going to be that side of us, our brain side of us. That's, we are in trouble, people. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, the body. I mean, I thought better for the body. I mean, somebody that's in a good physical shape, somebody that's strong, buff, if you want to call it that. Uh, somebody that's, uh, that's got it together and uh, that em embodies, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger-like. I couldn't come up with that, so Joseph will have to do, and uh, he'll be our body for tonight. So we have, uh, we have the mind here. And we have the body here, and we are in so much trouble. And then, finally, we needed uh, somebody to embody the spirit. Now, the cool thing about the spirit is it's kind of bubbly and bouncy. If we know anything about the three characters we have up here, we have a bubbly, bouncy one right here. He's bubbly and bouncy. If you talk to him much, you're not sure where you're going to end up because he's going all over the place. And so that makes it fun. But in order to properly set this up, I, I, I want to incorporate some things uh, in this. The first three, uh, the, we're talking about six different, if you will, formatting uh, or, or formats of the, the thought process, uh, if you will, how we're going to operate and so we're going to use this uh, to, to do this. Now, the first person that we talked about last week uh, was the fleshly controlled man. The fleshly controlled man. The fleshly controlled man is first focused on the body. Now, remember last week when we talked about the body, uh, the body is, is highly emotional. Uh, if it feels good, do it. He wants the body pleased. This is talking about our fleshly part. It's talking about keeping this happy, keeping this outside of me happy. The dangerous part of that is Paul says that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The Bible repeatedly refers to the flesh as our as sin. 
We struggle in our flesh with our. That's what. That's what. What musters up the, all our uh, the 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 the, the uh, what do you call them when, when we're attracted to something else? The what's that word? Uh, huh? I don't know the wrong answer. Yeah, he ain't the smart one. And uh, but the 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 the, uh, the the emotional side of us that just wants to please me. That's what we've got in first name here. So the first person we're discussing is a fleshly minded person. Uh, the Second thing we find uh, about this, oh, where'd you go, wrong page. The, the first, he's got the mind. Second, he's got the mind. And so the mind is here. Now, let me explain what's going on. This means that when the mind who's logical, the mind who should be logical, when the logical mind wants to logic and think, well, this is a bad idea to stick this, uh, this, uh, 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 hair clip into the electrical socket. I think this is a bad idea. This one thinks that would be cool. Wouldn't it be neat? I wonder what would happen. And so he goes at it. The mind is trying to talk to him, but he overwhelms the mind and says, shut up. I'm going to do what I want to do because it looks like it'll feel good. The third part of this individual we learn, if you look at our in, in, in instructions here, the third, third part uh, is the spirit. But the interesting thing about the spirit here is this spirit has yet to become alive. This spirit is not saved, if you will, this individual. So the spirit needs to die. Go ahead, die. Die. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the spirit is dead. So in, in illustration number one, what you ultimately have is you have a, a, a man uh, who's, who's maybe a... a, a, a Lord, and maybe never been exposed to church. Maybe he's never been around church. Maybe he has. But he's rejected church, so he's not saved. Uh, but he allows for his emotions, what feels good, what seems good, to be what directs him through life because he will not allow the mind to control him. Now, the illustration of the individual that we have here, we have seen depicted all over our nation of late. What we have seen is we have seen people with no spiritual life. They're dead spiritually. They say, what's that mean? That means they're not saved. I'm not saying anything ugly about them. They didn't get saved, most of them. But many of them uh, are not saved, and they're just doing what feels good. Can I tell you what feels good to the human flesh? Is it to be stroked and prodded and, and, and built up? And that's exactly what we see in our society today. If somebody, this is a kind of individual that if he sees something that he feels is an injustice, instead of engaging the mind and trying to alter the injustice in the United States of America where your vote matters, where you can go in logic and you can follow proper procedures to have your case solved, Instead, the body reigns supreme, and the body's going to do what the body wants to do. What's the body want to do? Protest. What's the body want to do? Right. If it feels good, do it. Mind don't get to say nothing. Spirit's dead. Right. Illustration number one, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about ind individuals that have no. So let me just say this, okay? Lest we be too quick to judge people in this condition, we need to pray for them to get saved. Because that's the only hope we really have. Even if they don't get saved, we need to hope that somewhere along the line this switches. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that as, as a young person does all kinds of silly, stupid stuff when they're young? They're operating on the flesh. All of a sudden, there's a trigger in their mind. Something triggers in their mind that, oh, uh, I probably should grow up. And as they're growing up, there's a natural inclination for some thinking to be involved. And as thinking is involved, then sensibility seems to show up. This is a good definition, that second person, uh, the unsaved moral person. What's that mean? That's a person that thinks, and now he swapped position with this guy. He doesn't just he doesn't just react on what feels good now. Now he logics it out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it really sensible for me to do that? 
And he logics and uses reason and logic. Now, spiritually, he's still in the same condition, isn't he? He's still down here. Ain't got no life there. So the spirit really doesn't have much to say there. So he's got the mind controlling the body. The problem with this kind of individual is they tend to, uh, they tend to overthink. Or think. Think way out there. And they only operate in how their mind thinks and they're limited because there's no God at all. And so it's only what they think is right. Uh, you have religions even built on this concept where the mind is the God. If you've ever, uh, I, I used to, when I was homesick, I would, I, I, I would watch. There was this, uh, the, the Scientology. They would have a reading from the Scientology, and I would sit and, wa and watch this reading of Scientology. Are you asleep yet? No, go to sleep. You're just dead, not asleep. Uh, <laughs> But I would watch this reading of Scientology, and you know what the Scientology concept is? Basically exactly what we've got laid out here. God doesn't matter. It's all what the mind thinks and perceives things to be. Problem with the mind, you know what? We're, do, you know, did you, do you know that our world operated real funny at one point? Our very first president, George Washington, died. You know why he died? Because he got a little sick, flu maybe. And somebody bled him to death. Because back in that day, the mind said, hey, the blood's got to be the problem. Let's slit the wrist, let him bleed out. He bled out, and that was it. It did fix the problem, it just didn't keep him alive. <laughs> he no longer had any complaint anymore. <laughs> president, is there any complaint? Is there any complaint, President? Not that he's dead. Not that you just killed him. So the, this is a dangerous position to be in if you don't have any God. You don't have any direction in life, so you just wander around aimlessly. Can I say that sometimes in this concept, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble. One can only imagine. And thirdly, we have this, uh, this interesting layout here uh, that happens. First of all, you have the mind. And then you have a spiritual side. Now, remember, the spiritual side's dead. So, but you can, no, you stay on your knees. You're dead. Lay that down. There. <laughs> right there. You can be on your knees. I'll let you see. Get head, blood to your head. And the body's way down here. This enters into a whole new area. Because now you have a mind that, that tries to think spiritually. Have you ever talked to somebody that's unsaved? And they try to logic spirituality? Can I tell you, that is a lost cause. Yeah. Their brain goes everywhere. Can I just tell you, I believe this is where Greek mythology shows up. I believe where this is where all the gods and Thor and, and what's some other guys that, that show up, all that, uh, uh, those big gods of, and, and that Greek mythology and all that transpires. There's all dreamy. Where does it come from? It comes from a pseudo-spirituality, which isn't alive because it's dead now. It's not alive because it's dead. It's dead spiritually, but it's trying to figure something out. There's got to be something spiritual. So you have the mind trying to tell, trying to create a fictitious spiritual, and the body's way down here. It's a, a little important. Now, the dangerous thing here is that now we cre can create our own religion, and we have. It's exactly what we have with the Muslim world. You stop and you read back what Muhammad did, and you'll find this is exactly what happened. You had a man who was, had been like we originally started off with. The body was controlled. He was very impulsive, kind of on the side of crazy man, doing all kinds of crazy, defeating of people. And then all of a sudden, he grew up, and he decided, i got to get some spirituality in there. But he never looked to God for his spirituality. He just looked to whatever felt good. And he looked to his mind, and his human mind carried off, and he created some fictitious story based loosely off of hearing tales from the Bible, tales from his historical connection. He created his own religion, and now we have people all over the world killing themselves, literally, to be a part of this. Mind-boggling. But it all stems from this mindset when the man has no spirituality, no true spirituality, because his spirit is, is dead. Now, fifth, or fourthly, uh, in our little list, 
We're going to enter the saved world. Praise the Lord. We can finally bring some life. Uh, this individual has accepted Christ as Savior. And up from the grave he arose. And so here we have our little spirit has arrived. And uh, was it rough being dead? Yes. Kind of fun, huh? Yeah. Now I that what you're doing back there. You're trying to hold your head up. Now you just laid your whole body down. You don't want to do it. Go figure. Note. I did not put Casey down in that position. Do you know why? He would have been asleep a long time ago. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. So, now we have a different number four. We have an emotional Christian. An emotional Christian. Okay, remember, our, I should have labeled you all so we would know better. Remember, we have body. We have now a lying soul. We have spirit. But this one's built just a little bit differently. The body is over here. The mind, let me get my, I don't want to do it wrong. The mind and the spirit is next. There we go. All right. So you have the body and the spirit. Now, the spirit's alive, so he's a Christian. We're a saved person now. But he's not allowing the spirit to have the first place in his life. The spirit's alive, he's saved. But he's still trying to do what appeals to his flesh. What feels good. If it feels good, I'm going to do. He doesn't, he doesn't factor any thought in there. There's no knowledge or understanding involved. It's simply based on what feels good. A person like this is very dangerous, and we've seen in Christianity way too much. We have a whole bunch of people being controlled by emotionalism. And so they have, a, they have Christ uh, aligned in their heart. They've accepted Christ. But they never can do a whole lot for Christ because they never allow the spirit to have the position he should have. God should have first place. He never gives him that because he's going on emotion. This is a kind of Christian that doesn't like certain things and will justify doing things that the Bible might say is wrong because it doesn't matter because it feels good, so I'm going to do wrong. Even though I'm, I'm saying the truth is that this very confused way to look at things. It becomes emotional thing. Everything has to appeal to the flesh. Uh, they, they have uh, uh, many of these uh, church services that have a, a big shindig, if you will, and I have a, a lot of music, and that's the way our churches are going now. There's nothing at all wrong with music. But if you have a music service that lasts uh, oh, 45 minutes and you have a five to eight minute little spiritual devotional and send people on their way, how much spiritual growth are they going to have? Well, not a lot. Because though music is good and uplifting to the soul, it's an emotional feeling and it feels good, but there's not much grounding. There's not much pointing to the truth. There's not much truth imparted. And so they long for that. If they come to a church like ours that spends time trying to teach God's word, they'll get bored. And they'll want to go to a place that appeals to the flesh. And so you have an emotional type Christian. And then the second uh, Christian, if you will, the fifth individual we're going to talk about, uh, the unproductive Christian. And first you have in the unproductive Christian, you have the spirit who's first. But you have the body that's next, followed by the mind. Does this make sense now? So you have the spiritual side, so you're uber spiritual. What's that mean? You are a spiritual person. I am spiritual. But everything spiritual is based on how the body reacts to the spirit. In other words, you have a person here that's Christian, comes to church, tries to follow the Lord, tries to do right, or at least make it appear that way. But they never engage in the knowledge and understanding of God's word because they really don't go that far. I don't want to invest that much into God. That I really know and understand what he's got for me. I'm just going to go with what feels good. So there's a spiritual aspect to them. They might come to church. They might be regular church attenders. But they'll come to church and attend regularly but not do much because they don't want to, they don't want to engage much. Can I just be honest with you? And I got a few of them up here. Teenagers fit into this category. Because teenagers, do you know what they want to do when Brother Dusty's talking? So now. And I know they go to the La La Land. Yes, they do. Nobody knows where La La Land is, but they do. You 
you get it, I often give it their name, Nettie. We have Nettie. Nettie has Nettie's world. And Nettie goes to Nettie's world whenever something's going on that she's not really going to engage in. I'm at church because mom says I got to go to church. Dad says I got to go to church. Some of them even come on their own to hang with their friends. But when it's preaching time, we go into neutral. Why? Because we don't want to engage the brain. We just want to do what's fun. And the reality is that there's a process to this, and we've got to build on the process. And so you have a person here that's a good person, but they lack discipline in how they operate. Uh, there, there's not a, a lot of discipline. They're, they're, they're good people, but they just don't have any discipline. There's no depth to them in the Christian realm. A bump, just, just here's an extra in a bump in the road of a person set up spiritually, they're spiritual, but then based on their emotions, a bump in their road, a difficulty in life, oftentimes you won't see this person back in church when they have difficulty in life. This, I promise you, is why many of us as preachers are extremely scared. Because I think most of us preachers realize many in our congregation are spiritual and their, their, their flesh is over their mind and many of our Christians today in our churches that come, Sunday morning only Christians sometimes, that never engage the brain. So they're at church, they're filling their 18 inches of pew, but they're not engaging truly into God's word and don't want to build and allow themselves to become a productive and, 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 and a truly a spiritual directed man. So finally, what we're left with is a spiritual man, and this is the difference in the spiritual man right here. Now, if you logic with me, and I don't know if you followed what I'm trying to say, but ultimately what you have here is you have the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. This is direction by God. This is a connection, the direct connection to God's Word. This is controlling the mind. Therefore, what the mind thinks is tainted by God's word. Did I use that word? It's altered by God's word. In other words, I don't, th I don't think like I want to think unless the spirit filters out because I don't always think right because I'm human. And this is ultimately the way we need to build our lives. We need to understand that we need to be spiritual. We need to have that life. We need to allow the Holy Spirit first controlling factor, the first thought in our life. And then secondly, we need to engage the brain. It's time to lock the brain in. When I come to church, it's what I long for in the teenagers. I love it every once in a while when I had to, uh, we used to have tea, it's question and answer with the teenagers. Every once in a while, now I don't, I'm not with the teenagers as much, but every once in a while when the teenagers come up and ask me a question. I love that. You know what that means? You're listening to what's going on, you're applying thought, and you're entering this zone. It's a scary zone. Because you're actually using your mind that you've let be dormant all these 13, 14, 15 years. But when you start doing this, when this starts happening, now you learn this, this thing that I, this, if it feels good, do it scenario, that mindset is very dangerous. And so it's okay to be a little bit wild, but if you don't control wild, wild will take over and you'll be in all kinds of trouble. And so ultimately, in our illustration here, God desires for us to be spiritual and then allow, apply our intellect, or as, as we'll go on, and you'll understand, hopefully this will make more sense uh, beginning next week, you'll, you'll be spiritual, then you'll apply intellect, knowledge and understanding coming together into what we call wisdom, where you're actually applying spirituality with knowledge and understanding and it filters down to the body and now becomes wisdom. Now you're threefold being working in unison. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. God desires for us to operate this way. This is what's so frustrating about so many people that are on a conservative plane and so many people on the religious conservative plane. Because we don't operate based on what Donald Trump says. What I've learned by what Donald Trump says is I've learned when Donald Trump opens his mouth what he says he's going to do. Yeah. I mean, it just says what he's going to do. I don't like his approach to saying it. I don't like it. I don't like how he goes about saying it. But a person like this can handle somebody like that because the proof was in the pudding, wasn't it? 
And for four years, we watched a guy that many of us had no idea how I was going to operate in a political scene. But man, he did a wonderful job for those of us that are principled. That operate on principle rather than what feels good. And that's exactly what you have here. You have somebody who's got godly principles now gauging and engaging the mind of the control, central control unit of the body, telling the body, this is how you're going to act. And when you get them all three working together, what you get is you get a human being that functions on what's right instead of what feels good. Y'all, you're going to be seated. Give them a hand. They did a good job. I'm going to try to fill in the blanks. I don't, did I leave? I kind of left a bunch of blanks. Let me go back through and, and go through this. And let, me, let me see if I can finish something like just real quick. Before salvation, I think I went through this. You got most of it. Number one, fleshly controlled man. His first body. You see that? Body, mind, then spirit. But they're dead to Christ. This spirit, you see, is not capitalized in our little worksheet. And their mind above is above their spirits. The spirit is little regard for God and the Bible. The body is then in control of everything. So it's living to please their own physical desires with no regard to God. This is a crowd, and I put this in the crowd that runs the entertainment world, and it really does. It's a, it's a crowd that just is about to please however, whatever I can do to draw a crowd. Second, uh, number two, unsaved moral man. First the mind, and then the body is next to work. But remember, uh, the spirit is dead to Christ. They go first mind, and then body, and then spirit. And then thirdly, you have a religious person. It's first the mind, then the spirit, which is dead to Christ, and then the body. These are religious people, but man, do they have some of the bizarre talk. You talk to them. Some of the music that everyone thinks is so awesome and dreamy. Some of you remember the music from the 60s and 70s. Some of it's real dreamy. And it's like, whoa, looking out over the stars and seeing wonderful, beautiful nothingness in it. And it is kind of soothing, relaxing music. But, but it really doesn't have nothing to it. I mean, it seems cool, but it doesn't really have anything to it. And I put uh, in the bottom bullet point, often these people are used by Satan in the educational field to corrupt the minds of their students toward God and Christianity. They come up with their own way of religion. And unfortunately, that's what we've seen. But then after salvation, first of all, you have an emotional Christian, or number four there, an emotional Christian. The body, the spirit is alive in Christ, and the mind, but the mind's way down yonder. So you have the body still in control, and the body in control is dangerous. Second, number five, an unproductive Christian. First has the spirit, so you're spiritual, uh, but next the body is in control. So the spirit tells the body, but the body doesn't always get it to the mind. It certainly doesn't factor anything through the mind. And so this person generally lacks, in the, at the end of that little statement there, lacks self-discipline. And then number six, the spiritual man is first spirit, and then mind, and then body. In other words, he's emotions are not dictated by what he feels. His emotions are dictated. In fact, there are times where I, and this is what I grew up with men in my life that did what was right to do because it was right to do. It wasn't always fun. It wasn't always what we wanted to do. It was what needed to happen. I was taught being a man was you do what's right to take care of your family, take care of what God wants you to do, and factor everything else out, just go forward and do what you're supposed to do. Ultimately, I believe this is what God wants us to do. And I last word in there is a, this is a man of character, a highly character, a principled individual, somebody that operates based on principle. We're going to jump from that next week, and we're going to jump into the book of Proverbs. And I think, if you'll bear with me, I think the book of Proverbs will come alive to you, how I can become that final person. And just for the record, the last three all are Christian, and the last three oftentimes in our life we can point to times where we've gotten them out of kilter. Uh-oh, I got a little emotional that day. Uh-oh, I was thinking a little bit more than I should this day. And we will learn how, I think, through the book of Proverbs, we can factor in the principles of the book of Proverbs to keep us as close to right most of the days as possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this little lesson. Thank you for the boys that helped uh, uh, make it happen. I pray that you bless them and certainly bless us, Lord. I, my goal tonight was to try to make this clear uh, because I believe that if we ever grasp this understanding, 
And when I come to church, I, I, I should do it, and allow the spirit to get into my mind because I've accepted Christ as Savior. But I need to engage my mind on the things of you, whether it's in church, my Bible reading, uh, listening to Sunday school. I need to engage my mind because I want my mind to control my body. Because when I get it the other uh, 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 other way, the body can take control and kind of mess things up. Well, I pray that you help us as we go forward in this little study and help it to become clearer to us and, and make more sense and help us to, to become be better servants for you, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You are dismissed.